Welcome to Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video is on lectures 16 and 17 in seminar 1. If you enjoy this video, please consider liking it, sharing it, and subscribing to my channel. In this video, I'll address the following questions. 1. What are the five difficulties Lacan identifies in Michael Ballant's object relations theory? 2. How does Jean-Paul Sartre's analysis of the gaze in being and nothingness establish a radical intersubjectivity? And 3. How do linguistic phenomena structure the imaginary? Usually these videos have, for the most part, covered one lecture at a time, but lecture 16 was abbreviated and both 16 and 17 are concerned with contrasting Lacan's approach with another contemporary psychoanalyst, Michael Ballant. Ballant can be situated in the object relations approach. He distinguishes two modalities of love, pregenital and genital. The pregenital is noted for its needs being saturated by the object that satisfies it, represented by the mother's love. The pregenital is also noted for being a closed system that lacks any recognition of the other and their needs. This changes with genital love, whereby the subject begins to acknowledge the other as a subject, taking into account their existence and concerning themselves with the many requirements associated with the other's enjoyment. Genital love is thus marked by a kind of psychosexual maturation that makes possible satisfying object relations. Lacan initially offers some praise for Ballant in incorporating elements of intersubjectivity within the fundamental analytic experience. However, Lacan spends most of these two lectures identifying differences he has with him and in so doing uses this as an opportunity to further elaborate his own theory. Lacan identifies at least five difficulties with balance theory. First, it ignores the premature birth and fetalized traits that are present from the beginning. This is marked by the distinctive and prolonged dependence of the human baby upon its caregivers and gives rise to a permanent biological instability in our species. This is something we have addressed in previous videos regarding the differences between humans and animals. Second, balanced theory of love appears to run into a contradiction. Lacan first asks, if the pregenital is marked by a kind of autistically closed system, where do the capacities for recognition that emerge in genital love come from? In other words, how do intersubjective capacities emerge from a closed system of primary love? Lacan does not find a satisfying answer here, leading him to conclude that this theory runs into a blind alley or a theoretical impasse. Third, a reason for this contradiction is that balanced theory of love fails to consider the polymorphous perversity of the child, whose perversions provide the privileged existential possibility for tearing open and forming a gap in us, allowing the symbolic to make its entry, and so giving rise to the possibility of recognizing the other as a subject. This is because perversion requires a third term for it to function. To illustrate this, Lacan draws upon Jean-Paul Sartre's analysis of the gaze in part three of Being and Nothingness, a work that Lacan calls essential reading for the psychoanalyst. Given his high praise and my own inclination to emphasize the philosophical dimension of Lacan's work, let's spend some time now discussing this part in greater detail than is provided in Lacan's lecture. I believe it will be helpful in clarifying what Lacan ultimately does with this analysis. Prior to part three of Being in Nothingness, Sartre has been describing what subjectivity is like for itself, which is the being for itself, consciousness, and it, as it is contrasted with the being in itself, which might be equated with the objective body. But there is another dimension to my existence that is pervasive and integral to lived experience. It's an experience of being a me. When I experience myself as an I, I take the attitude of looking out at the world and giving it the meaning I determine for it. However, when I experience myself as a me, this radically changes my experience. To explain this, Sartre evokes the example of shame, which is a kind of relationship to myself that I only get access to when I'm in the presence of someone else. I don't feel shame when I do something awkward or strange, 
except for the fact that I'm aware of others having noticed me do something awkward and strange. So the other mediates the relationship between myself and me. This is my being for others. Shame is a form of recognition that results from recognizing myself as how someone sees me when I become judged and looked upon as an object by the other. Because I can only gain access to certain parts of myself through the other, the other is necessary for me to realize myself. Sartre writes, Therefore, if we wish to grasp in its totality the relation of man's being to being in itself, we cannot be satisfied with the descriptions outlined in the earlier chapters of this work. The other is something very different from other objects. When I perceive objects, they appear at a distance, remote and indifferent. People don't appear like that, however. They don't appear from a distance, but rather they appear intimately. I feel myself inside of them, in their consciousness, watching me. As Sartre says, there is a spatiality which is not my spatiality. This is not to say that the person cannot appear as an object to me. To look at the other as an object is what Sartre calls the conversion and the degradation of that original relation. I can take an attitude of distance, like the social sciences, and attempt an objective description of this person, their function within an environment, their behaviors, but this misses out on a fundamental aspect of existence. Once I consider the idea that this other is an other like me, who sees objects as I do, then it becomes conceivable that I can become one of those objects that the other sees, that I can be seen as an object. So the look of the other is not the act of an objective being, but another subject. The look is not literally about the eyes, which are merely sense organs that support the look. In fact, the look can be felt when one hears footsteps, or when one feels exposed in their own house when the shades are open and the light is on at night. In fact, we can expand upon Sartre's analysis in thinking about the function of the internet. The internet has provided a new world in which people felt they could operate in anonymity. One can no longer feel the look of the other. Shame was reduced and the person was free to express themselves in whatever way they wished. This, of course, has had a dark side to it with the emergence of cyberbullying and what are called internet trolls. However, it's also the case that now that we operate in the internet, especially more recently, that it's quite easy for others to gain access not only to our passwords and banking information, but also to our search history. There's the increasing feeling that whatever you type into the internet is available to the watchful eyes of the other. On page 406, Sartre makes one of his most famous statements. My original fall is the existence of the other. Now, what could he mean by this? Similar to the internet example I just offered, Sartre uses the example of someone who could either be described as a peeping Tom or a jealous lover who's peering through a keyhole in the attempt to see without being seen. In this situation, I find myself in my total facticity and total freedom a being unto itself, making choices and dealing with limits. However, at that moment in which the peeping Tom hears footsteps and notices someone noticing them, the entire situation changes. For the first time, I become aware of myself as a being. Before I could focus all my attention on what I was perceiving, I may have been a jealous lover, but I didn't think about myself in those terms because I wasn't thinking about myself only what I wanted to look at. But when the other arrives and I experience their look, my freedom is turned back upon me and I experience shame, which reveals to me who I am, a jealous lover. In this situation in which I am now ashamed by the look, the other becomes a master over me and I experience myself being alienated, removed and disconnected from my possibilities, no longer master of my situation. Sartre says, the other is the hidden death of my possibilities. At the end of this section, Sartre briefly mentions God, who becomes the concept of the other pushed to the limit. And so, it's not even necessary for the look to come from an actual human. It may be a computer algorithm, or it may be an invisible, omnipresent, and all-powerful other who 
I imagine watches over me and all my thoughts and every move I make. So now let's bring this back to Lacan's lecture. Lacan addresses this analysis by Sartre in the context of balance analysis of pregenital and genital love, in which Lacan notes the difficulty of determining how the capacity for intersubjectivity could emerge from an original autistic state. Lacan then begins to suggest his own way of accounting for this by pointing toward the polymorphous perversion of the child that results from the permanent biological instability of one's premature birth. Perversion requires another to sustain it. One can't be sadistic or masochistic with an object. One needs another subject. And as such, this primary perversion constitutes a necessary opening for the third to enter into the closed dual relation between infant and mother from the very beginning. It's a radical or original intersubjectivity missing from balance theory. Lacan illustrates this using Sartre's description. Here we have what at first appears to be a closed system of two individuals caught up in an imaginary relation that is fundamentally narcissistic, I see you and you see me, but a third term is implicated in recognizing that I'm seen and in knowing that the other knows that they are seen by me. Now we become subjects for one another. How is this third term given? It's through the manipulation of the symbol. The fourth difficulty with balance theory is that it fails to recognize the role of the linguistic phenomenon in the formation of intersubjectivity. Yet language is what facilitates presence and absence. As Lacan puts it, and in reference to an earlier lecture, the symbolic function allows elephants to enter here. The other I see operates only on the imaginary level, but the subject I encounter in being seen gains its existence through the operation of language. This begins with naming, which inaugurates the symbolic within the imaginary from the very beginnings of life. From there, the symbolic will structure the imaginary in more and more complicated ways, shaping the inflection of one's imaginary commitments. The word inflection is a grammatical term. It's a process whereby words are modified to express different grammatical categories, such as alterations involving pronouns, verb tenses, and degrees of comparison. As such, the original captation of one's imaginary commitment can be symbolically transposed onto something else through what Lacan will elsewhere call the acts of metonymy and metaphor, which are the linguistic equivalents of displacement and condensation in Freud. The imaginary is accessible only through the symbolic as it's realized in adult speech, and in particular through the childish language that comes through it. And by this, I think Lacan means the errors and mistakes that emerge through speech. This allows access to the lived history of the subject, a history that's shaped by the seesaw of desire moving between imaginary identifications and symbolic introjections. This brings us to the fifth and final difficulty with balance theory, which concerns his starting point. Balance begins with the experience of the child and extrapolates from that the experience of the adult, which leads him into all sorts of difficulties. Polymorphous perversity, childhood sexuality, the Oedipal complex, and all those other concepts that sound strange to the un uninitiated ear are wrongly assumed to be in reference to the child's experience. Lacan, in contrast, begins with the experience of the adult, and it's from that point of view that the child's experience is understood. Psychoanalysis operates by a logic of retroaction, the après coup, whereby the later determines the earlier. This is true in its theory as much as it is in practice, in which the analysis early trauma acquires a traumatic quality only after the introduction of the symbolic, which itself becomes retroactively present from the very beginning. This is perhaps one of the most difficult ideas to get our minds wrapped around since it violates our standard notions of time that undergird the linear causal reasoning found in the empirical sciences. And with that, we'll finish today. Thank you for watching. As always, comments and questions are welcome. And I look forward to seeing you all next time.